Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist, Jackson Crawford. There is a certain kind of person who watches my videos and gets mad at them, who has already said, well, you didn't specify Old West Norse or Old East Norse. And uh, in this video, what I'm going to talk about is that difference and why it ultimately doesn't matter very much except for linguists. <laughs> So specifying Old West Norse versus Old East Norse is a little bit like specifying British English versus American English. Yes, there's a difference. No, for the most part, it doesn't really matter. So let me first uh, talk a little bit about what the difference is. Um, we can already see, let's, let's talk a little bit, let's, let's back up just a moment, be patient with me. I talk about the period of time that we're talking about. In the Elder Futhark runic inscriptions, so up to about AD 700, we see a pretty unified language around Scandinavia. In fact, in the earliest part of that period, it's pretty hard to even tell the Scandinavian languages or North Germanic languages from the West Germanic languages, like the ancestors of English, Dutch, and Low German. But by the time that Scandinavia as a language community is clearly distinct from the West Germanic language community, so uh, let's talk about, say, after about 8700, although the split from West Germanic is much earlier than that, we see that no longer in Scandinavia is the Elder Futhark runic writing system used, but rather the 16 letter younger Futhark writing system. And speaking of small differences, there's also the uh, long branch versus short twig systems, which are uh, used in different places by different carvers there. That doesn't matter for the language difference. By the time that the younger Futhark is being written, although already in the very last period of Elder Futhark inscriptions in Scandinavia, we see some minor differences between Old West Norse, which is the language developing after, again, 8700 is a nice, convenient break to use for both Elder Futhark versus Younger Futhark and what we can call Proto-Norse versus Old Norse, because not only do we have that change in which runic system is used, but also we see some really major language changes right about that time, principally the effects of eye mutation or eye umlaut, which I'll come back to in a moment because it's actually kind of important for the Old West versus Old East Norse distinction. So right about this big divide of about 8700, we do see some differences between the Old West Norse and Old East Norse areas. Now Old West Norse includes Norway, although really not all of Norway, because Viken the area around Oslo, southeastern Norway, is so interlinked with eastern Scandinavia that it has a lot of East Norse features. So let's say the bulk of Norway, certainly western Norway and northern Norway, and areas settled from them. So that's going to include the isles north of Scotland, right? Your Orkney, your Shetland, actually your Hebrides. Um, Faroes, Iceland, and Greenland before uh, that a population of Greenland many centuries later, it was uh, West Norse. And then we have East Norse, which is Sweden, Denmark, and the very distinct language community in uh, Viking Age and medieval Gotland, which is now uh, politically part of Sweden, but linguistically was really its own thing at, in the, the Viking Age and the Middle Ages. So right away, notice that actually the, the population base is East Norse, right? Sweden and Denmark are the most populated areas. Uh, West Norse covers more geographical territory than as now, I guess, but maybe not now, but population-wise, it's, it's, it's much lower. Now, some of the differences that we see 
early on are some differences in the effects of so-called braking. Now, this is where um, an E, an old E vowel, is broken to a YA by a, uh, an A vowel that once followed it. So this is, for example, the reason why in Old Norse, and when I say Old Norse without specifying what I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about Old West Norse, which again, I'll come back to why in a moment. But for example, Old Norse hjarta versus English heart, that's from an earlier herta. So the ah has broken the e to ya in Norse. Um, or earth is a good example of this, which also has u mutation. So that's uh, protoform erthu, English earth, just dropping the u, but Old Norse yorth, right? It's broken, so you get that j in there before the, the new mutated vowel. The main place we see the difference in breaking between West and East Norse is in the extremely important word, one of the words that we see most often in runic inscriptions and in Ro Roman alphabet writing, I, right, the pronoun, the object form of which is me. Um, so in Old West Norse, that's ek, but in Old East Norse, we get that broken form, yak. And if you speak a standard modern Scandinavian language from the continent, that will be more familiar to you because, of course, that's Swedish ja, Danish or Norwegian bukmo, jai, right? So that ja form comes from the old East Norse. Uh, and of course, in, in Eastern Norway, you see forms of the I pronoun that come from that old East Nor Norse form too, right? Your ja from the Eastern part. Um, whereas in Western and no Northern Norwegian dialects, you tend to get egg, eh, eh, forms without the ja. Another thing that you see is long U's in West Norse are long O's in East Norse. So a really good place to spot this is in the word for bridge, right? We actually see that in a fair amount of runic inscriptions because people would build bridges as memorials to the dead in very early Christian Sweden. And we already see uh, based on runic writing, that this is Old Swedish bro. Of course, that's Modern Swedish bru, right? It's uh, That vowel has raised now, but it was an O at the time as it's still written. Uh, and of course, it's an O in Danish, right? You, there, there's the big um, detective TV series, right? That's uh, brun in Swedish and blowen in Danish, right? With the O's. But in West Norse, that's bru with the long U, Right, so modern Norwegian Nynorsk, I brew, right, with the, the, the U, and uh, Icelandic brew. The spellings of these words, by the way, reflect more the medieval pronunciation than the modern pronunciation does, because actually the Swedish and Icelandic words today sound like one another, but they got there different ways. Icelandic kept the old vowel, whereas Swedish has has changed an old long U to an old long O, but then all the long O's have raised to U sounds in modern Swedish. Anyway, it's another big difference. Another big difference is in the effects of I mutation. So I mutation takes a back vowel, right, a vowel in the back of your mouth, like a, o, u, and moves it to the front of your mouth, like a, u, i. And um, this affects back vowels that used to be before an I or a J, an E or a Y in uh, proto Norse. In Old West Norse, so our Icelandic Norwegian, that affects the present singular of strong verbs. This is why we have the, vow, the, the, the verb koma, come, which in uh, Old Icelandic we get han kemr, Old Norwegian we get han kumr. Actually, in a lot of Norwegian we get kemr too. Sometimes in Icelandic we see kumr. But the point is that vowel is moved forward in the mouth by an eye that used to be there, right? This was proto Norse, something like komis. Um, by the way, that kumar with the O slash is a really distinctive uh, feature of the language of the Old Norse poem, Hlavamal, if you've ever noticed that. Now in Old East Norse, that eye mutation is uh, uh, regularized out by analogy with the infinitive or the plural form of the verb. So we get komar. And of course, you might note that, again, modern continental Scandinavian languages all go with that un form 
other than modern Norwegian Nynorsk, which has the Ayum lettered form, Hjem. One other big thing that you notice early on is um, the sequence long e a, so ea, becomes ja, j long a in West Norse, but not in Old East Norse. This is why in Old Icelandic we see sjo, right, modern Icelandic, sjau, modern Norwegian Nynorsk, sjo, where in Swedish or Danish or modern Norwegian Bukmal East Norse we get se, right. The protoform for each is sea, but in the East we've just dropped that a, the infinitive ending, whereas in the West the infinitive ending together with that long e in the root have come together as a new J long A vowel that only happens in West Norse. So these are some of the principal differences that I think about when I'm asked about the difference between Old West Norse and Old East Norse. They're noticeable, but perhaps not much more noticeable than the differences between pretty broad American English and, and a pretty broad dialect of, of British English. Certainly, I think they're less noticeable than the differences between, say, European and Brazilian Portuguese. So I'm going to come back after a quick word here and uh, talk about why these differences don't matter for the learning of Old Norse. <laughs> So if you're learning Old Norse, and by the way, how do you do that? I mention this all the time and, and, and people don't see it. I recommend a new introduction to Old Norse by uh, Michael Barnes and Anthony Falks. You can get that for free as of November 2022 as a download from the Viking Society for Northern Research. I am also working on and uh, am now, thanks to Nano Rimoing this, um, well into my own uh, textbook for self-study of Old Norse, so I hope that'll be available in the next couple of years. Uh, I also have some videos that uh, introduce you to Old Norse and get you to uh, some basic uh, reading fluency if you if you work through them. Uh, all right, if you're reading Old Norse, learning to read Old Norse, what you're learning to read is Old West Norse. Why? You know, I. I <laughs> people ask this and get upset about this and I don't know what who someone put this in people's ear right there's some serpent out there whispering uh you know Jackson Crawford is a traitor to Old East Norse and I don't know who started this um you know I, I somehow got the impression that Neil Gaiman somewhere might have said that it was a big deal right Old West Norse versus Old East Norse um maybe this has been reinforced by one of those pagan guru big beard guys who says you know like oh if you're swedish you need to do old east norse your swedish heritage or whatever i i don't know but here's the thing there's barely anything to read in old east norse most of the stuff to read is in old west norse so why on earth would you focus on reading old east norse first when there's not enough of a difference to justify focusing on just that versus old west norse right there's no there's no Old East Norse Edda. There's kind of a little bit of saga in Old East Norse, right? We have Guta Saga, the saga of uh, uh, Gotland. But actually, the language of Gotland is more like Old Icelandic in some central respects because it's so conservative than it is like Old East Norse, uh, at, at least by the Middle Ages, where you get all the monoplingization of vowels. Um, if you want to read Old Norse, Learn Old West Norse, which really means Old Icelandic in about the 1200s, right? We have to pick something in the Old Norse timeline and somewhere in the vast expanse of land where Old Norse is spoken from Greenland to parts of present-day Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we have to pick somewhere to focus on, right? And the reasonable place to focus on is where the stuff to read is from, especially the really cool stuff to read. Right, the sagas of Icelanders, these exciting Viking stories of frontier Iceland and, and, and the North Sea and the North Atlantic a thousand years ago. Uh, the poetic Edda, right, the stories of the Norse gods and heroes. The saga of the Volsungs, right, one of the great 
uh, you know, really the Iliad of the North, or I hate saying this, but it is kind of the cultural equivalent, Star Wars of the North. Um, you know, th all of this stuff is in Old Icelandic, circa 1200 to 1400, right? That is where you, you have Old Norse literature. So why on earth not focus on that, right? It's a little bit like saying, um, you know, you, you want to read something that I wrote. <laughs> Not very smoky bear likely, I guess, but say that you did, and you pick up uh, a book that's, you know, say you don't speak any English, and it's, you know, a teach yourself English book, and the first thing that it teaches you to read is, you know, standard British English, so I don't know, you're reading a, a, a Neil Gaiman or something to, to start with. Well, that's, it's not like that's a huge jump to make to reading my weird, fossilized, you know, rural Western American English. Um, there's a few differences of grammar, some differences of word choice, uh, if you're hearing it out loud, uh, some differences of pronunciation, but it's not like learning to read, yeah, you know, Neil Gaiman is actually a pretty good example because we have kind of different uh, modern en English styles. Um, it's, it's not like some huge jump, right? You're not betraying <laughs> my English. Like I, I, people would get these weird emotional feelings about this. Um, you would learn to read whatever there's a lot to read of, and then you would just, you know, kind of have to get used to, uh, uh almost just a different style. And that's kind of what you've got with starting with what we sometimes call classical Old Norse, right? Old Icelandic from about 1250, 1300 versus reading other styles of Old Norse. Um, there's definitely different spellings, right? Uh, old West Norse spelling is a little bit more like Old English spelling. Old East Norse spelling is a little bit more like Old Low German spelling. So for example, um, you know, you have some peculiarities you have to get used to, like the the F, F, W thing that sometimes you use just where uh, Old West Norse has uh, just an F for the V sound. So Hava can be spelled in a really unfamiliar looking way in Old East Norse with Swedish. Uh, if you really want to read a bunch of Old East Norse, you're going to wind up reading fairly late-ish Old Swedish, which is going to mean getting used to monophthongized vowels. But if you're already in the Swedish, it's not so hard. Um, you know, you're going to see Stan instead of Stain, that kind of thing. Um, you're going to have to get used to reading Fraktur if you want to read a lot of Old East Norse. But the thing is, I know the thing that people want to read in Old Norse isn't, you know, the, the, the Old Swedish Bible. They want to read sagas and Eddas and stuff. And of course, if you want to read stuff that's in, in runes, right, say the Rook, Runestone, that's so old that there's even less difference between Old West Norse and Old East Norse. So... Folks, calm down about this Old West Norse versus Old East Norse distinction. Yes, when I talk about Old Norse, I am principally talking about Old West Norse because that's what we have. That's what the cool stuff is written in, right? Um, it's a little bit like saying, you know, there's a... I don't know. There's a pretty part of this country and there's an ugly part of this country and you only show us the pretty part which betrays the, the, the not as pretty part or something, it, 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 it doesn't, right? I, I'm here to teach about a language and its literature. Um, Old East Norse is interesting. I'm already regretting the pretty versus ugly part of this country analogy. Um, but there's just not as much there, right? There's not as many roads to it. So if you're looking to take a road trip through Old Norse, Old West Norse is where you're going to be taking your road trip because you can't get your vehicle uh, to a lot of Old East Norse. Now, there are some pretty inaccessible parts of Old East Norse that I guess you could soup up a Jeep to get to. How about that? That's a slightly better analogy. But that's still going to take you building a Jeep that's roadworthy that will get you over the Old West Norse foothills that you need to access the Old East Norse. And, and by the way, there's no, like, intro to Old East Norse book, right? There's no book that's going to start you with reading Old East Norse versus Old West Norse. The way to learn Old East Norse, if that's what you're looking to do, is to go through learning 
classical Old Norse, which means, again, Old Icelandic circa 1200 to 1400 AD. Um, I recommend Barnes and Falks. My own book, of course, will be focused on that area. Uh, my videos are focused on that, that time and place. Um, and then learn these little differences that make it possible for you to read Old East Norse. Well, anyway, from beautiful Old East Utah, I'm wishing you all the best. And thank you, Patreon, very much for your continued support through what I know has been a real tough year for uh, a lot of people financially. Christmas cards, as usual, coming soon. All right. All the best.